Good evening, class. In today's class, we are going to be discussing the case study of Hecla Mining and why they are on the brink of bankruptcy now after six years of basically management blunders. So the share price of Hecla Mining, which is on the New York Stock Exchange symbol HL, Harry Lloyd, is at $1.32 per share. It's rallied almost 5% today, probably some short covering in the rally. However, the share price is down a lot over the last few years. A lot of it has to do with the silver price being at $14.40 right now. The gold price is at $12.79.30 when we're doing this show. This will end up being a reference for classwork or educational material later down the line. Want to go back and learn why not to buy an individual mining stock as an investment. So, Hecla Mining. I've studied this company extensively for many, many years. And unfortunately, they've been the victims of not only a low silver price and the silver price going lower, management thought the silver price would rebound, but management also thought that they should transition the company away from mining silver and the company owned, prior to five or six years ago, they owned two producing silver mines. They owned Lucky Friday Mine in Idaho and Greens Creek in Alaska. And those were their two main producing silver mines for many, many years. The company, I believe, has been mining for over 100 years. It's been a pretty well-respected miner within the industry. They weren't considered a massive miner, but they've been around a long time. I believe they have not filed bankruptcy. I'd have to go back and check. However, I believe they have had to do some reverse stock splits and share dilution and things like that over the years, but that is very common. But we are at a share price now for Hecla Mining, where recently they violated their debt covenants and i'll talk about that in a little bit and also the vultures are now circling and by vultures i mean lawyers and there's at least five lawsuits now against heckle mining that have just been filed so the vultures are now circling the company the short interest i'm sure is absolutely massive i didn't look up the short interest but i'm sure it is very expensive to borrow the shares for heckle mining and i'm sure the puts are very expensive now so if you were going to short, this is not financial advice, but if you're going to short Heckle Mining, should have probably done it about six to eight months ago, maybe a year ago, when you saw that they had done another bad acquisition. So Heckle Mining, I've been talking about the silver and gold mining industry extensively for a long time. Heckle Mining is one of those companies that I caution people about that was trying to transition away from mining silver trying to go and buy mediocre gold mines and the management team and they didn't do a good job expressing this to shareholders they just said that we're going to become profitable and we're going to buy more gold mines they didn't say that well it's not profitable anymore to mine silver they didn't say that we have to we basically have to transition to gold and hecla over the last six years has done more than five acquisitions with over a billion dollars of shareholder capital, of equity dilution and debt, a combination of these two things. Their most recent acquisition was for $450 million. And unfortunately, the management team kept repeating to shareholders that the numbers work. And this is what you get into with the mining industry where you run the cash flow projections and the revenue projections versus the debt on an Excel spreadsheet and the numbers look good. However, with the mining industry, and I've tried to stress this for years now, that so many things can go wrong that either you don't produce the margins that you think you do or the mine is not as good or there's too much capex, capital expenditure involved and Hecla was a victim of this. And Hecla did this to themselves. So Hecla, over the last six years or so, has bought a lot of either mediocre or producing, uh, well, mediocre producing gold mines or mines close to production, mostly gold, because they've been get transitioning away from silver. And the numbers that they were expecting, the margins, the free cash flow, have not been there. And so they used way too much debt. And Nolan Watson has warned many people, go back and listen to the last Sandstorm Gold Nolan Watson interview I did only about a month or so ago, and listen to his warnings about a mining company having debt in their cap, permanent debt in their capital structure. And what the mining industry in general does not do is they don't use debt 
for an acquisition and then focus on paying off the debt and getting rid of all the debt. So there are way too many miners now that are have way too much debt throughout their capital structure, which means they have like senior secured debt and then they have revolving credit facilities and they have all this different type of debt, different tranches of debt, debt due at different times. And this is how miners, a lot of miners, primary gold and primary silver miners have what they have done to survive. But we are seeing this now. Hecla Mining is on the verge of bankruptcy the next six to 12 months. There are a couple ways that Hecla could potentially avoid or delay bankruptcy, but it is going to be very painful for Hecla Mining shareholders. And the management team, unfortunately, has been paying themselves lots of salary and lots of share options throughout all of these blunders. They have destroyed shareholder value, just massive amounts of shareholder value. It is really sad. Coeur d'Alene has done very similar things, transitioning away from mining silver because there's not margin there. So we will see how long it takes for Hecla, but the options that Hecla has left to delay bankruptcy, none of them are good. They can sell some assets, which in this bear market, they're not gonna get top dollar for. Recently, they've been buying some mines for hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't think they're going to get top dollar, top dollar for some of those mines if they try to sell them now. Probably have to sell them for pennies to a better capitalized miner. That would raise cash by time. They could do a reverse stock split, which most shareholders hate. And that doesn't change the market cap of the company. That doesn't change the market cap of the company. It normally reverse stock splits only allow management to keep diluting. So the normal game with mining companies is once they do a reverse stock split, there's normally massive share dilution coming either immediately or very shortly after. So I'd watch for that as well. I believe that that game may be tried, but the management team needs to go. They just made dumb mistake after dumb mistake after dumb mistake. And this is the problem when you run the numbers, the cash flow projections or revenue projections with an acquisition, merger and acquisition, and use a lot of debt to do the acquisition and then the numbers do not work out. So the debt stays fixed. You have to keep making the debt payments and the, you, as a miner, you cannot control the commodity price. And there's so many problems that could potentially go wrong at the mine and this is what Hecla has run into. There's been a lot of problems with the producing gold mines that they have acquired. Just big CapEx problems, the revenues that they were projecting are not there and Hecla is still saddled with massive amounts of debt. So I think Hecla, it's a question, for me, it's a question of when and not if. The management team needs to go. The vultures are circling. Maybe management can delay things another 6 to 12 months, but unless silver prices rise or they come up with some type of miracle, I don't think anyone's going to come in and acquire them either. I don't. If, if I was a larger silver miner, a larger gold miner, I don't think I would come in and take on the responsibilities of their debt right now. There's just too much debt. This is a good point by JRL Innovations. So Hecla did buy a, they bought the Montanor mine and the the other mine from Revit Minerals. Uh, and there's two combined ones, but they were expecting, this is a massive silver copper mine, but they were expecting the silver price to rise and then that they could eventually bring this online. But Hecla has been bringing additional silver mines, a couple of them over the last six or seven years online. I believe one in Mexico. And I'm not sure what the margins are, but they're not generating free cash flow. And Hecla has, they gambled that the silver price would rebound. And then while they were gambling and trying to restructure the company to more revenues in gold, they were still having problems with their silver mines. So there was a strike at Lucky Friday in Idaho, and I believe that mine's been shut down for two years. So they have some problems with expenses, and they were relying on the revenue for that, and they don't have it. So a lot of things have gone wrong for Hecla, and here, here we are at this point. Now, there's a good article that was just released today from Iderant on his resource sector digest on Seeking Alpha, one person commented that the banks get the medal, the management gets the paycheck, and the shareholders get the finger. So I think, unfortunately, that's pretty accurate. So let me read part of this article about Heckle Mining. So Heckle Mining and its latest set of challenges at the Nevada operations drew a number of comments 
under his newsletter, along with several requests for further discussion. So Heckler's collection of mines in northern Nevada in a recent addition to the company's portfolio stemming from the last year's $460 million acquisition of Klondex Mine. Klondex Mines. According to the CEO of Hecla, Philip S. Baker, the company, quote, structured the deal to use our excess cash balances so our shareholders can benefit from the approximately 162,000 gold equivalent ounces a year of production while minimizing dilution, end quote. So I don't think Hecla really had that much cash. I think that was just smokescreen bullshit lying. And Hecla used a lot of debt and share dilution. They did not have that much cash. So less than a year later, they observed that precious metals output at the mine is falling a long way short of, ex of predictions. And if there ever was any excess cash on Hecla's balance sheet, then this cash has disappeared tr already. So operational issues at Hecla's Nevada mines were discussed in some detail during the Q&A session on the company's Q2 earnings conference call. Several issues seem to be at play, but the main problem appears to re uh, revolve around water management at Fire Creek Mine. So this wasn't even a problem that they knew about. This water management or flooding with underground mines or, you know, there's all these problems that can occur. You know, if it's an underground mine, there could be a cave-in or it, there could be a strike by the workers who want higher wages if it's in a foreign country. The problem with some of these foreign countries is the mining unions. So even if the commodity price is going down and the mining company is on the verge of bankruptcy, you have these mining company unions and the mining workers demanding higher wages. Well, the mining company is about to go bankrupt. The mining company has no margin. They're, they're running the mine at a loss. They need the cash flow anyway. Normally, they won't shut down the mine if it's around break even or running at a small loss. But if it's running at a large loss, then the miner's really in trouble. So there's so many things with this, this flooding issue for Hecla at the Nevada mine wasn't even known about. And then here they are, they were already, they were counting on things to go smoothly. They leveraged up their balance sheet with mergers and acquisitions and then things did not go smoothly. Now they're in trouble. So quote, with respect to the water, what it has done is it's limiting places that were able to go into the mine. Because we cannot deal with the water fast enough to be able to effectively move forward, so our advance rate really slows down and our ability to mine in those areas slows down, end quote. Simply increasing the capacity of the pumps and the existing reverse osmosis water treatment plant won't do the trick here as Hecla will also need to go through permitting for an expansion of the current water discharge limit. This sounds like a nightmare. So permitting process, new permitting, new property plant and equipment investment, new capital expenditures that were not planned on, they're in big trouble. This company's, they should probably, might have to sell the mine in a massive loss and take a big charge. And this is why, to go off on tangent for a second, it's related, but it's still a tangent. This is why the larger royalty and streaming companies overall do better. You have companies like Osisco Gold Royalty, they're over a billion dollar market cap. They made a really bad acquisition with the Orion Mine Finance deal. They grossly overpaid by, uh, for a billion dollars worth of royalty and stream portfolio from a private equity company. And I remember having discussions with Nolan Watson and other people in the management team at Sandstrom Gold about the assets that were being purchased. And they told me half of the stuff in the portfolio was grossly overvalued and bad and that there were problems with it. And Osisco Gold Royalty paid a billion dollars for it in equity and cash. And they've ridden a lot of it off, hundreds of millions of dollars, and the company's still fine. Why? Because they have a they don't have to deal with the CapEx issues. So they can they don't have to bet the whole company on one deal. Like a, a mining company now, the way things are with mines and their capital structure, a lot of these mining companies literally to grow, they have to go all in on a new mine. So they have to use a lot of their cash. They have to sell more shares. They have to take on hundreds of millions of dollars in debt to build the mine. And if something goes wrong, and there's literally dozens of things that can go wrong, the miner is risking potential bankruptcy. This is why mining is dangerous. There's a long list of problems. And this is why the royalty and streaming companies, your Wheaton Precious Metals, which I think is cheap, your Osisco Gold Royalty, which is I think is cheap, Sandstorm Gold has more growth than anyone in their pipeline already. Someone bring, it keeps annoying me and bringing up Nolan Watson selling shares. He had to buy a condo in downtown Vancouver. His, the investor relations department has discussed this, okay? His commute was over three hours per day, Monday through Friday. Okay, for the CEO of a publicly traded company with a market cap of a billion dollars, you cannot waste three to six hours living in a suburb in Vancouver with that type of traffic. 
So hopefully now that he has more time to devote to the company, he paid all cash for, the, for a condo. Downtown Vancouver real estate is expensive. I've been having discussions with Nolan Watson about Vancouver real estate for years and how grossly overpriced it is. He didn't want to do it, but the company has competitive advantage with offices in Vancouver and Toronto. Okay, people keep asking me about this and that's why. He's saving himself three to six hours per day. So yes, he overpaid for the, for the condo, but now he's going to be able to spend more time building the company. So I think long term, this is going to build shareholder value. He didn't want to sell the shares, let me put it that way. But he lives a very frugal lifestyle. He does not even fly first class. For the CEO of a billion dollar company, he flies coach. And he only gets first class plane tickets after like uh, mileage upgrades. Okay, everyone runs, that company is run very efficiently. They do not waste money. So hopefully that answered your question. But the business model in general, this is why the royalty and streaming company is far better, far more efficient. They don't have to bet the whole company on a couple of bad deals. Okay? Once you're large enough like Weed and Precious Metals or Franco Nevada or Royal Gold, if you have a bad deal, you write it off. Okay? There's idiots on Seeking Alpha still writing articles and mentioning Colossus Minerals from 2012 acting like Sandstorm Gold learned nothing. It's dumb. Meanwhile, you have Osisco Gold Royalty, which I think is still a good company, but they made some really bad blunders the last couple years. They've written off bad deals, and they still have underlying good, good assets and investments, and they can overcome those bad deals. A mining company, however, cannot. Okay, Mining company, one or two bad deals, enough leverage, too much debt on the balance sheet, bad capital structure, mining company's in trouble. Yamana Gold, probably not going to go bankrupt, but the... Market no longer trusts the management team at Yamana Gold because they lied to shareholders about their best, lowest cost margin mine, and they sold it when they were telling everyone that it was their best asset and they were going to invest in and hold on to it. And then they do a 180 and sell it without telling anyone that they were planning on selling it. That's why the market doesn't trust Yamana Gold anymore. So Yamana Gold, the rumor is Yamana Gold's up for sale anyway. I don't know what type of premium, but it'll end up for, uh, it'll probably end up getting merged or bought out. And this is why the royalty and streaming company is better. They can put growth in their pipeline and they do not have to gamble the whole company. And Pierre Lassonde, let me talk about Pierre Lassonde, Franco Nevada. So Franco Nevada is a great company now, but when Pierre Lassonde and his business partner got started with Franco Nevada, first of all, they'd be heavily criticized for doing this now if they did this now. But they put most of their own savings, around $2 million, they put almost all of it in, all in on one royalty. So they put almost everything they had into building Franco Nevada, and they bet it all on one and one or two royalties. Okay, and that's how the company was built. There was luck involved. With the larger royalty and streaming companies, yes, you do need some luck. Maybe some of these smaller royalties will hit, and there, there will be bigger exploration upside. But they don't have to gamble the whole company away on growth, or replacing reserves, or replacing production from a depleted mine. And this is what Hecla had to do, or they, the excuse me, management felt they had to do. And management's going to pay a hefty price. Well, the CEO is still going to get rich. He's still going to walk away. I don't know if he's going to get another mining job, but he totally destroyed like over a billion dollars, many billions of dollars in shareholder value. And what they probably should have done, what Hecla probably should have done was when they did use debt, they should have focused on paying it all off. So do an acquisition, pay it all off. No debt or little debt, little amounts of debt. And Nolan Watson talked about this, no permanent debt in their capital structure for Sandstorm Gold. I think it's important because when the commodity price goes down, which the mining CEOs can control, a lot of the mining CEOs hate their commodity anyway. A lot of mining CEOs hate gold and silver and they won't admit it's manipulated. And the ones who do admit it's manipulated won't speak out against it, except for Keith Newmar. So it is, it is a very frustrating industry. Uh, Coeur d'Alene is not much further behind Hecla, although it looks like Hecla is in the worst shape right now. There is articles from the Iderant, and I'll attach a, a link to it. I probably should read more about this article. And he's talking about shorting Hecla now, but it's too late. It should have been done a while ago. So Hecla, Hecla now, at this point, guys, they are in default of their debt covenants. So the way bankers look at debt covenants is there's a number of ratios that are important. 
There is like your debt to equity ratio, your debt to operating cash flow, debt to cash flow ratio. And the other ratios, there's a couple more ratios. There's the interest, the EBITDA interest before earnings taxes and depreciations, interest taxes, excuse me, EBITDA, earnings before interest taxes, uh, depreciation. And then uh, let's see here, leverage ratio, total debt less unencumbered cash divided by EBITDA. I don't think that's, the bankers use those ratios, but using EBITDA I don't think is good, but that's how companies get away with more leverage than, the, than they should. So the bankers were sold on giving Hecla more debt because they were sold that the acquisitions would be quote unquote accretive. And if you don't know how to look on a balance sheet, for those things, you know, assets minus liabilities equals equity for debt to equity. That's like just basic accounting. But EBITDA, which is what the a lot of financial engineers use and the investment bankers use, I don't think it's very good. Earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. There we go. That's EBITDA better. So there's all these leverage ratios. But the bottom line is that the acquisitions that Heckler made, and they made a lot of them in the last six years, have not worked out. And now they're in violation of their debt covenant. And they talked about this on their Q1 earnings call. And they had to get banker approval to not have the banks call on the loans. So that's how bad things are for Hecla. And finally, a lot of people are starting to talk about this. But the problems for Hecla started in 2013. They did a massive finance takeover of Auras and Mines. And let's see here how much they paid. Oh, they just have a massive amount of debt on their balance sheet. They have $35 million in senior secured, secured notes maturing in 2019 and 2020, $518 million in 2021. That's a massive amount. And the cash should have gone towards reducing the debt load before doing another acquisition. Just massive amounts of debt. And you know what? If the numbers had worked out on their spreadsheets, they would have paid it back, but they leveraged to the hilt gambling that gold and silver prices would rebound and that the production numbers at the mines they bought would not drop. And this is the danger that they got themselves into. It's a really sad case study, but unless you spend the time looking at the com mining company's debt and the potential mistakes that management made, Unless you're very sophisticated and you're willing to put in a lot of work and check on these things to see if management is doing bad acquisitions routinely, you probably shouldn't own any individual mining stocks. And this is why I like the royalty and streaming companies. Because over the long run, the royalty and streaming companies in a bear market, in a bull market, in sideways markets, they're going to eat the lunch for the, uh, for the gold and silver miners. They're just going to eat their lunch. Now, doing deals, there's lots of deals available, and I'm sure Hecla went to Sandstorm Gold and some of these other royalty and streaming companies, but who's going to do a deal with them now when they're risking bankruptcy? You're going to have to write off the whole deal. So this is, this is the risk. There's opportunity to do deals with miners like this, but if the metals prices don't rebound, if you do a, a large streaming deal now with a company like Hecla, you're going to have to write the whole thing off. So the paper price manipulation and the Chinese central planning causing a lot more base metals supply and a lot of silver byproduct, up to 200 million ounces of extra silver byproduct because China has so much demand for base metals. This is what it's causing. You're going to see you're going to see the mining companies to buy time to try to the primary silver miners. A lot of them tried to transition to primary gold mining. I've been talking about this for at least three years. No one else. How many other people in the industry, any analysts, were talking about this? Almost zero. That's because I, I have good contacts and I pay attention. And the mining, the primary silver miners, this transition is not going to work for Hecla because they use too much debt. They got too greedy. They're betting the metals prices would rally. They're betting that the revenues would be smooth like their Excel spreadsheet said, and now they're in trouble. First, you keep saying talk about dating apps. This is a gold and silver mining show, so I'm not going to talk about dating apps today. There's plenty of other, um, you know, red-pilled and magtow podcasts, so this is not one of them. 
I will occasionally interject some funny stories, but not on a gold and silver. Uh, I'm doing, you know, obviously a lecture, basically. This is a case study on why Heckler went bad, why management team screwed up, why miners should not use this type of debt, why miners should focus on, if they do use debt, paying it back as quickly as possible and only use it strategically. Use debt, you pay it off. If you want to grow, use debt, you pay it off. Not, not like what Hecla Management did where, oh, we use some debt for one acquisition. Oh, silver and gold are going to rebound. Oh, we're going to take on even more debt to buy another gold miner. And then we're going to be really rich when gold and silver rebound. And they kept doing this. They added over five gold mines in the last six years to try to transition. And it backfired. It would have worked, maybe, if gold and silver had rallied. But they did not plan on the downside. As a CEO, the best thing you can do to protect your shareholders is think of worst case scenario, okay? This is why the royalty and streaming business model is better. Worst case scenario with a company like Sandstorm Gold, the company gets sold or bought, okay? They're not leveraging the balance sheet like crazy. They do not have lots of permanent long-term debt. And if a asset, one of the royalties or streams, if there's a problem at the mine, it's just a temporary drop in revenue and cash flow, okay? It's just a temporary drop or the mine gets sold to a better counterparty or something like that. The royalty and streaming company, this is why they can diversify faster. If you have 25, 30 or more assets online generating cash flow and one or two of them go bad, your revenue just takes a temporary hit. You don't go bankrupt. This is why the business model is way better. You have 20 to 40 people working at the company depending on the size of the royalty and streaming company. You don't have a lot of overhead. And the revenue per employee is way better. The Franco Nevada and Royal Gold and Silver Wheaton, well, Wheaton Precious Metals now, have won awards for best business model. Out of any company in any industry, they've won awards. So I already answered your Nolan Watson question. I don't need to talk about that anymore. If you don't believe his answer, that's fine. Please sell your shares. I really don't care. I am very happy oper operationally with how Sandstorm Gold is. Sarah Morrow, Silver Streams Online, largest single source of revenue in company history, Arizona Gold Royalties Online. And it looks like that the mining debt that Sandstorm Gold owns from Equinox Gold, there's about $20 million worth of it. And Equinox has to make payments on it starting in 2021. I, I'm op cautiously optimistic that Ross Beatty and the Equinox Gold CEO will take care of that before 2021. So that could be an additional $20 million in cash for Sandstorm Gold to either do another deal with or pay off their revolver faster than people are counting on. And the, the share buyback plan with free cash flow is small. There's people criticizing it. It's, it's just a small buyback plan. They have plenty of other cash flow online. They, you, the, this is a, there is a lot of opportunity to do deals for royalty and streaming companies, but you have to be very, very careful right now due to counterparty risk. The counterparty risk is as bad as it, bad as it was in 2008 and 2009 for mining companies. So there will be mining companies going bankrupt in the next 6, 12, 18 months. If metals prices do not turn around, the miners have too much debt on their balance sheet. Silver prices particularly are doing horrible. And the silver miners, they're still running the mines. So the mines are running at losses. And the miners at the mine are out of ways to cut costs. There really are almost zero ways left to cut costs. And on top of this, there is a lot of CapEx maintenance, CapEx or capital expenditure that the miners have delayed spending on for years. First Majestic Silver almost got in trouble with this recently. They had to do a bunch of CapEx at San Elena. And they had to do a bunch of CapEx, I think, at the newly acquired San Dimas. And it looks like they're finally through a lot of the CapEx investments and some of the production problems. But First Majestic Silver was getting dangerously low on their cash levels and they had to do dilution. Unless silver prices rally, a lot of the miners are penny stocks, Curtis. There's going to be there's going to be lots of bankruptcies 12 to 18 months from now. The miners are out of ways to cut costs. The management teams are out of financial engineering and leveraging the balance sheet. And there's no appetite, very little, if any, appetite to raise equity, even for the, a lot of the producing miners. 
There are no, there, no one wants to buy equity right now. The demand for gold shares is is the lowest it's been probably in two thousand since like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and twenty fifteen. So the counterparty risk for mining companies, for royalty and streaming companies, is as dangerous as it was in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and twenty fifteen. So if you see a large, uh, large, excuse me, a large royalty and streaming company do a deal with a miner right now for a hundred million dollars or more, you got to really look at the mining company, make sure that the mining company can make it that the mining company ha can slog through uh, either sideways metals prices or lower metals prices. And on top of this, you have the oil price, which has been pretty high. That's going to hurt margins. JRL, you talk about the uh, silver mine in Montana. Hecla probably thought that silver prices would rally and that they'd be able to bring that mine online. It would make the money. And they just, I believe they just bought that with shares. So that was share dilution. But the market, I think the share, the stock went down after that acquisition. So they added assets that didn't generate them any cash flow. And the assets they did add, that the assets they bought that did add cash flow, they used way too much debt. They've drastically over leveraged their balance sheet. And the way things are with the debt coverage ratio is normally the management team with calculating their debt coverage ratio, the company is going to be a lot more optimistic than the bankers are. And this is why you got the debt covenant breach and Hecla arguing with their bankers saying that they didn't violate the debt covenant. And then the bank said basically that they did. And then they're arguing. And then finally the bank said, well, you're going to have to start paying us back quickly. So is it's looking real, real bad for Hecla. The vultures are circling. There are no good options for Hecla at this point. Hey, Wendell, America Silver looks like, this is not financial advice, they look like an interesting junior because Pierre Lassonde is involved, and it's a senior management team from Barrick Gold and Sandstorm Gold is involved too. So on paper, it looks like um, there's some good investors in the deal, but we'll see if the mine comes on, on time and on budget because there's always that risk, even though it's in Nevada with infrastructure. Okay, you want to talk about rare earths. I spent more time looking at Neo Materials technology. The person who said that they have five hundred million dollars in debt is incorrect. I look at I looked up their April investors presentation. They have around hundred million dollars in long term debt, and they have thirty million dollars per year in free cash flow. They pay a solid dividend, and they actually for Neo Materials technology they actually emerged from bankruptcy with Molycore, and they actually emerged better. They benefited from the bankruptcy, believe it or not. I did research like in the 50 page presentation, I was looking through the footnotes and they got a extra processing facility for rare earths in the value chain in Estonia. They got it almost for free. They got it for pennies on the dollar. And then, and this is a big deal, they got the Molycore rare earths water filter that Molycore had innovated. Their scientists had innovated, but Molycore had done a really poor job selling it. And they got that as a product. And so they've had a lot of success selling that. Neo Materials has. And Neo has so much research and development and intellectual property now that they have created, I think, a bunch of new rare earth products in the last in the value chain five years to sell. And 20% of all the revenue is from five is from new products that did not even exist five years ago. So they are doing the innovation. They also have a rare earth export license to Canada. They have facilities all over the globe. Neo, Neo Performance Materials does. Symbol NEO on the TSX, NEO, like from Matrix. And I would not buy the shares. This is not financial advice. I would not buy the shares over the counter. If you have an interactive broker's account, I would buy them on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So the shares are far more liquid. But it looks like, operationally, it looks like an excellent company with good assets. They have a lot of assets. They have a lot of intellectual property, a lot of research and development. They have some top top scientists. They also have a joint venture deal with Honda. And Honda, they've innovated new rare earth motors and new magnets. And they are building unique motors and magnets for Honda in the joint venture. So for their electric vehicles. So they have a lot of really cool partners. 
and they have uh, factories in China in the rare earth value chain. So it looks like they have a lot of good diversification. They have a lot of different processing facilities all over the globe in the US, Canada, China, South Korea, Europe. This is a really solid rare earth value chain company. It's making money, 3% dividend. They look like an interesting risk reward play to me. Company operationally looks good. Oh, and they have gap profits, not non-gap, gap profits. So they don't have to do any, any accounting tricks. They have gap profits. Hey, David, good to see you on a live stream. Good call on the palladium, on the palladium manipulation. David says, gold and silver, bullion, privately owned, not susceptible like the gold miners. In the meantime, I own Gold Corp for 14 years and shares in end worth less than when I bought. Yeah, because Gold Corp tried to grow by buying and building new mines and they screwed it up. But the royalty and streaming companies, look at the case history of Franco Nevada. Franco Nevada, once they re-IPO'd 2007, 11 straight years of dividend increases. Franco Nevada shares, despite the gold and silver price doing almost nothing the last seven years, seven or eight years, Franco Nevada shares are up way more than what they were. They run $40 a share. Let me see what Franco is at right now. One second, I'm pulling up Seeking Alpha. Say Franco's at $74 a share. So if you bought Franco Nevada for around $40 a share, from 2007 to 2009, it dropped a lot, but you still did extremely well and you got 11 straight years of dividend increases. This is proof the business model works, folks. Excuse me. This is proof that the business model works, folks. Now, the management team at these companies, they can overextend the balance sheet with debt. They can do bad deals. There'll be write-offs. But as long as the management team does not do too many bad deals in a row and use too much debt, and have to have too many write-offs in a row, the company survives and can easily survive a bad deal or two here and there. The company doesn't go bankrupt. It's just an inconvenience that there's a write-off for a quarter or two. Look, even though Cisco Gold Royalty, they wasted a billion dollars, in my opinion, on the Orion Mine finance deal, and Cisco is still fine. There's some people pissed off they wasted the capital, but the company, underlying company operationally, with their cash flow, their royalties, cash flowing, they're still fine. They still have a growth pipeline. So they just write off bad deal. People are a little grumpy. The company doesn't go bankrupt though. And that's my point. Why the business model works. It's designed to survive and thrive in a bear market and sideways markets. As long as the people operating the, the royalty and streaming company don't do bad deal after bad deal in the, in the bear market or sideways market with bad counterparties. There is not a lot of good rare earth plays. It is super expensive, super difficult. Many years, it requires a lot of extra permitting to bring a rare earth mine online. There are nuclear, there are radioactive nuclear commission permits. People are not aware of this because you have some rare earths that are radioactive and then you have all the thorium. That's the byproduct. You have to get permits for this. Then you have to pay extra money to store it. So bringing a rare earth mine on, as bad as it is to bring on a gold mine, a silver mine, a copper mine, a rare earth mine is even worse. It may even be worse than a uranium mine. I think a rare earth mine probably for how many years the environmental damn the environmental approval process, if it's not in China, the permitting process, the capex for separating out the powders, rare earth powders into REO, if you're going to build an extra processing facility into REO. The extra capex and the years and approval process is a larger headache and more money than even a uranium mine. So Linus, if Linus can get their act together in Australia, Linus would be a, a good risk reward. It wouldn't be an investment. It would be a bet. Oreo, no, REO, rare earth oxide. REO, rare earth oxide. I just talked quickly. The value chain, when you mine rare earths and you separate them, it is a pain in the ass to separate them because some of them are radioactive and some of them stick to the thorium. I don't want to go into all the details, but it is a real pain in the ass to separate all of them. And the grades on some of these things are super low, and that's why it's so expensive because all the extra chemicals you have to use. 
And then to even get the powders into oxides, you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars more to build another plant with CapEx. Linus spent, I want to say Linus spent over a billion dollars to build their extra um, rare earth oxide processing facility in Malaysia. And now due to environmental concerns, they have to move it back to Australia. The rumor, I just heard this from my China source. He said the rare earth expand is going to be complete. He said they're going to go, China's crazy enough to do it in the near future. China's going to go full rare earth export ban. I don't think it's a good idea, but it sounds like China wants to up the ante and really put the pressure on the U.S. and Apple and the American corporations. Okay, guys, well, there's a lot of questions and comments here about mining. I'd be happy to answer them later after the show's over. Uh, although not financial advice, I will give my opinion on some. But hopefully you learned a lot from this case study of Heckle Mining. I'll attach the Iderant article if you want to read more about Heckle's debt problems and the problem dealing with their revolving credit facility. But the bottom line is Heckle Management has made lots of mistakes the last five or six years, and now shareholders are about to pay for it. And this is why you cannot buy and hold an individual mining stock throughout all the cycle. And David talked about Gold Corp. At some point, management team, even if they're very well respected, will eventually ruin it. And let me just give you one more example before I let you guys go here. Let me pull this up. So this is from the Iderant uh, news release, uh, his, excuse me, his newest article. So news release of the week goes to Bear Gold for its offer to buy out Acacia Mining for an implied valuation of $787 million. He would like to remind readers that Bear Gold had spun out the same company back in 2010 and had valued the company at $3.7 billion at the time. So Bear Gold CEO Mark Bristow, who, by the way, doesn't even want to be there anymore, even after this large uh, merger with Rand Gold Resources, doesn't really want to be at Bear Gold anymore. He's talking about secession plan. He has a, I, I can't remember if he had his heart surgery or not, but it's serious. He doesn't want to be there anymore because after he got to Barrick, thinking it would be a big shot, an even bigger big shot job, he realized that Barrick has too many mines, too many production problems, uh, balance sheet problems too, and cutting costs. He's now describing the offer as, quote, fair. So Barrick sells a uh, spins off an asset, values it at almost $4 billion, and is now trying to buy the same asset back. So this is another, I would call it, large mistake by a mining company. And Bear Gold has had a long line of mistakes. And you will see lots of newsletter writer articles on Seeking Alpha talking about how Bear Gold is the best deal. Okay, Whedon did not have a choice. Whedon had to do gold deals. There were no other good silver deals available. Either the companies would not sell the silver or they had done all the silver deals available for growth. And I would suspect that some of these base metal miners, if base metal prices go lower, if China stops buying or takes a break from buying the base metals, some of these prime, uh, pr base metal miners could go bankrupt too. And that would be good because that would take off a lot of silver byproduct. I'm hoping that will happen. I would not worry about Nolan Watson selling the shares. That's just me. Operationally, the company is in superb shape. Cerro Moro's online, full production. Arizona's online. Things are looking really good. 30 ass maybe 30 assets online generating cash flow by the end of the next year, which would be really, really good. Meanwhile, you're going to see dumbass seeking alpha articles who I don't even comment under these guys' articles calling me names. I had to report that guy. He shouldn't be even be writing articles anymore. He just copies and pastes all the same BS from a year or two ago about Sandstorm Gold. It's just like, oh, they diluted their shareholders, and now they're solving their own problems with their share buyback. I know nothing about the company. I didn't even predict revenue growth of 20% in the last six months or 12 months. And I was telling people to sell the shares every time it got to $4 or $4.50. Look at me. I can read a stock chart and not even use my real name when I call people mean names. Okay, well, that's it for today's show. I've ranted enough. And no more dating stories for, for this show, at least. Got to save them for later. My friends, though, in person see these goofy things. It's, it's just getting ridiculous. Okay, bye for now.